Good morning. It is Tuesday, April the 28th, and I hope that you are having a good morning already and you are um, preparing to get started for the day. Uh, I have a book I want to share with you today called The Kid from Diamond Street, and um, I want to share this book with you because we are getting ready to um, go into the 1920s in our history, and we are talking about how uh, times are changing, and this book is set in the 1920s, and I want to give you um, a really good idea of uh, what it looks like at the time, what people are, are feeling and acting like, and this is a pretty um, cool book about um, a girl who was able to participate in uh, women's professional baseball at the time, and she was only 10. So it's pretty neat because she stands out um, with her accomplishments, but the book also in its illustrations and um, the writing gives us an idea, a little bit of the times that we're getting ready to enter, okay? So I'm going to try to show you the pictures uh, the best I can also because I really like um, the illustrations in this book. Okay, The Kid from Diamond Street. Edith Houghton used to say, I guess I was born with a baseball in my hand, and if you'd seen little Edith playing in the 1920s, you'd probably have believed it. She was magic on the field. Born into a Philadelphia family in 1912, Edith was the youngest of 10 kids. Nearly as soon as she could walk, Edith was playing ball with her big brothers and neighbors. It didn't matter that there was no such thing as Little League or that most girls didn't play baseball. If there was a sandlight game anywhere near her house on Diamond Street, you could bet she was right in the middle of it. So here's a picture of her. When she wasn't playing baseball, she was watching. From her parents' second floor bedroom window, Edith stared out at the park across the street where men played long summer night games under the dim, buzzy glow of the portable lights. Edith was 10 years old when she heard about the Philadelphia Bobbies, an all-female baseball team that was looking for new players. She grabbed her glove and rushed to Fairmount Park where the Bobbies were holding tryouts. The team was made up of older teenagers and women in their 20s, but the manager allowed Edith to try out, even though she was still in elementary school. Edith was so good, she made the team. Edith was so good, she was named starting shortstop. Edith was so good, she was playing professional baseball at the age of 10. She had to get her hair cut, as the team was named for the bobbed hairstyle all its players sported. Edith was happy to do it and happier still to get her first real uniform. But Bobby's uniforms were made for older players, larger players, not little kids like Edith. Her cap kept falling off until she safety pinned it to a smaller size. Her pants fell down until she notched new holes in the belt. And her two long sleeves kept getting in the way until she rolled them up. She may have been the smallest one out on that field, but there was nothing puny about her skills. Newspaper reporters wrote about the incredible plays at bat and in the field of the girl they called the kid. Because they were the only female team around, the Bobbies played against men's teams all over Philadelphia, throughout Pennsylvania, and as far south as Virginia. Edith's parents came home to home games whenever they could. When my father went along, he would always be talking about how great his daughter was and all. I'd be saying, Pop, would you be quiet? But her daddy kept boasting. He clipped newspaper articles and kept a scrapbook, too. And it wasn't only her dad who was impressed. Fans lined up to attend their games. Tickets and snacks were sold. People cheered. I guess we were an attraction, Edith said, being a women's team. The attention never mattered to her. The kid 
just wanted to play. In 1925, when Edith was 13, the team had an opportunity to set forth on a great adventure. They were invited to play against male teams, mostly college level, in Japan. The people of Japan loved baseball, and promoters were certain thousands of fans would turn out to cheer for the all-female team. Japan. Japan was halfway around the world. No one Edith knew had been to Japan. Most people she knew hadn't stepped foot outside of Pennsylvania. My parents had to go to school and explain to them about this, Edith said. The principal and teachers agreed that I'd get more out of that trip than being in that class. And it's true. So the kid set out on a long train journey across the country with the rest of the Bobbies. Edith was traveling without her parents, but Bobby's manager, Mary O'Gara, always kept an eye out for her, making sure older players were on their best behavior around Edith and the other teenage girls. They barnstormed through barnstormed through North Dakota, Montana, and Washington, playing eight exhibition games against men's teams along the way. I didn't care who was playing, Edith said, as long as we were playing. When they reached Seattle, the Bobbies got new uniforms and equipment and boarded the President Jefferson, the ship they'd take to Japan. An orchestra played, and the Bobbies threw paper streamers from the ship to the dock. They were on their way. At a big dance on the ship the first night, left fielder Nettie Gans got up and played violin with the ship's orchestra. Then the ship started rocking a lot. Edith got really, really seasick. Just about everyone did except for third baseman Fareba Garnett, who kept telling her teammates to stop thinking about it, which was impossible. But when the sea was calm and Edith was well, she enjoyed the daily customs of the boat, removing her shoes before entering her cabin, attending dances and parties, watching movies. The Bobbies even taught the Earl of Gosford, another passenger, to dance the Charleston. Best of all, was taking batting practice in the middle of the ocean. Right there on the deck of an ocean liner crossing the huge Pacific, the Bobbies ran drills and honed their baseball skills under a sky of endless blue. When a batter really got a hold of one, it sailed out over the rail and splashed into the dark waters below. We were knocking the balls out to sea, Edith said. No one was rushing to make plays against the railing. The drop down was a big one. When the ship finally reached Japan, the Bobbies walked down the gangplank, grateful to be back on land. Crowds were on hand to greet them, reporters to interview them, photographers to take pictures of them. Japan was nothing like Philadelphia. The Bobbies rode on rickshaws and were surprised to see that men and women alike wore kimonos. Everything was different, even the shape of their houses. The Bobby's first game was in front of the biggest crowd Edith had ever played for. Tens of thousands of people watched and cheered, but it felt no different to the kid because once you get out there to play, you don't see those people. You didn't even know there was anybody there you were playing. For the tour, a male battery pitcher and catcher played with the team. At first, Edith Ainsmith was concerned about the little pipsqueak at, at short. Eddie Ainsmith. He worried that a girl Edith's size wouldn't be able to handle his throws to second during a steal. Like a jolly uncle, he promised Edith a yen for every catch she made, and like the pro she was, Edith nearly got rich on that deal. A yen was Japanese money. Japanese reporters or Japanese newspapers reported on the crowds that came out to see the all-girl team from America. A reporter wrote that the female players were wearing all sports shoes instead of high heels. For two months, the Bobbies, in their sports shoes, played from city to city through Japan, winning more games than they lost. The Bobbies stuck together off the field, too, shopping in department stores, meeting Japanese celebrities, trying to use chopsticks.
As in summer camp, the girls often sang together. Edith and Nettie sometimes played piano. Second baseman Jenny Phillips played guitar. Nettie wrote, ly wrote lyrics about the Bobbies to the tune of a popular song, Collegiate. Baseball, baseball. Oh, we sure do love it. Nothing goes above it. Yeah. They also tried to sing a version with what they thought were Japanese words, but it was really just a mess of goofy sounding gibberish. We were having a ball, Edith said. But it was sometimes hard to be away from home, especially on American holidays. The night before Halloween, Edith and the Bobbies pulled together costumes and marched outside their Osaki Hotel. They knew Mischief Night, as it was called back home, wasn't celebrated in Japan, but they couldn't resist. They wondered what Japanese passerbys thought about their dressed-up selves, but it hardly mattered. They were together, celebrating. When it was finally time to return home, the seas were calmer and the only one person was sick, the one who had told all the seasick bobbies to just think about something else. Poor Fereba was green. They were still on a ship on Thanksgiving, and Edith gave thanks for her wonderful adventure and for the Bobbies, her baseball family. After their big feast, the teammates felt so at home that they got up to a little trouble. The Bobbies switched up the shoes people had left outside their cabins. What a surprise it must have been to find someone else's shoes waiting in the morning. When they arrived home, they were again greeted by reporters and photographers. After posing for pictures and saying goodbye to her teammates, Edith finally returned to her family and her home on Diamond Street. I had a lot of good memories, Edith said. I met a lot of fine people. I always enjoyed playing. Maybe that's why it came easier to me. I didn't want to stand still. And so she didn't. Not when she came home from Japan and not later, when she continued to play for other teams. How could she? when she was born with a baseball in her hand. Okay, here's some real pictures of her. That was her at the time she was playing. And then this is her older. She continued to play. She played with a couple of other teams. And then when World War II came, she served on a team for the Women's Navy and they played games. And then she became one of the, or the first uh, women's baseball recruiter, um, recruiters for, um, I think a Pennsylvania team. Um, and she died right before her hundred, hundred and first birthday in 1913. So she's a cool one to look up. You can find some, a little bit of information about her on the internet. Her name is Edith Houghton. Um, there it is right there. If you want to uh, try looking it up. But I thought that was really neat. Gives us a little bit of what's going on at the time. Um, recreation is really important. At is becoming more important to the American people, especially now that war's over. And so that that book kind of highlights it. I hope that gets your you up and moving, your brain going this morning, and you're ready to start. Have a good day.